it's time to experience the O on the Original Sports Podcast. Here's your host, Mark Maraday. Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of the Original Sports Podcast with Mark Maraday. Um, our guest this week is Olympic athlete Thea Lafon. She is a triple jumper from Dominica. Uh, she competed at the 2016 Summer Olympics in the women's triple jump. Her result of 12.82 meters in the qualifying round didn't qualify her for the final, uh, but she kept on going. She was also selected to represent Dominica at the 2018 Commonwealth Games. Uh, during the 2018 Commonwealth Games, she created history by becoming the first Dominican athlete to win a medal for Dominica at the Commonwealth Games after securing a bronze medal in the women's triple jump. Uh, she also competed uh, at this past 2020 Summer Olympics and did fairly well. Um, we're going to talk with Thea about her career as a track star and how it all began. Uh, she'll share with us her experiences as an Olympic athlete and how she stays at the top of her game to continue competing. For our We Just Gotta Know segment, uh, Thea will share with us the most memorable events she has competed in outside of the Olympic Games. Hey, Original Sports Podcast with Mark Maraday. My special guest today, I, I am beyond um, excited and elated to have um, Miss Thea Lafon from Dominica. She is a Olympic athlete. She's been there for the last two Olympic Games. She's a triple jumper, but she brings a wealth of talent in many other areas besides being an Olympic athlete. And, and she's a teacher, uh, a fellow teacher, and I just absolutely love that about her. Thea, how are you today? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. I know we work in the same general location, and I feel like I know wealth and superstar here. Uh, I, I just have the highest praise for people who are Olympic athletes, but you take it to a whole other level going back more than one time. So congratulations to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. Hey, look, w let me get right down to it. You're an Olympic athlete. You triple jump. I'm sure you have other sports you played as a youngster. So in your early years, what else did you do? Um, my early years was actually not quite in track and field or anything more team organized. Um, I was a dancer, so I was classically trained, uh, ballet, tap, and jazz. Wow. Um, maybe that's what kind of built the, you know, jumping muscles up, yeah. if you want to call it that, uh, the fast twitch. Um, but that's what I did for most of my life. And um, I only stopped doing dance when I got to around uh, middle school, high school, um, because my mom was just tired of paying the fee. <laughs> she was like, it's yeah. expensive. We're in public school. You can get these free activities after school. Find a free activity. Um, and that was a major transition. But before that, ballet, tap, and jazz, that's all I knew. So Kennedy High School did not have dance classes in your PE classes? <laughs> They did, um, but it wasn't an after school activity. And my mom had a rule that after school, I was not allowed to go directly home. I had to find something to occupy my time. Dang. Um, so Dang. fall season, I, my freshman year, I played volleyball and then winter season came around and I really thought I was going to be just a team manager, manager for, for basketball. Um, but my friends were all doing track and field and they told me about the coach, Kevin Monroe, who was like a great coach and was funny, but not the, not the person to mess around with. <laughs> And they talked me into joining track and field. And I, I think the reason I joined was because of very, really good peer pressure. So I'm thankful for them. Yeah, he's a good coach. I, I happen to know that guy personally. And I, I know where you are with that. So when did you realize that you were a gifted jumper then? Um, I think it took about my sophomore year. Freshman year, I was kind of getting my you know, feet in the water. Um, and towards the end of my sophomore year, I started realizing that I was clueless in what I was really doing but I was still beating people. <laughs> and so when you, when you realize that you don't know a lot, but you're still doing well, yeah. you realize how much, how much room there is for improvement. Um, and that's when I started realizing like, okay, yeah, I could, I like this and I'm good at it. And that's when I, it really started becoming more than just, you know, a sport did, to me, started becoming a passion. When did you win your first state title? My junior year. I believe, yeah. Junior year, outdoor. I won high jump, 
No, I didn't win high jump. I won long jump, triple jump, and the 100-meter hurdles. I won three. Any school records there? Um, yes, in the <laughs> high jump, long jump, and hurdles. <laughs> uh, all three, huh? And triple jump, and definitely triple jump, all four, four. It's so, fully the whole direction. So, so let me jump to this now. Do you see a yeah. young Thea LaFond in anybody? You can, you're still coaching, right? You help coach, right? So uh, my my head coach, I don't specifically direct or directly coach right now, but I do help out my, my coach when he yeah. coaches his athletes. Um, so I get to see, you know, different athletes from different schools, even outside of Maryland. Um, and so there is one person, um, well, even a couple kids that came through. I have uh, one's name is Stephanie, I'm forgetting their last name, Emma C2 from um, Virginia. But these girls graduated, you know, top three in the nation. Yeah. And um, it's just great to see, you know, young athletes with so much more room for improvement still dominating. And so these are my two. And um, one right now, her name is Genesis, and she's a senior, I believe, this year. Senior, yeah, this year. Um, and she is just, you know, a bundle of potential, and I can't wait to see what happens. But they yeah. definitely reminded me of a younger me. Did you help out at Northwest when uh, Taylor Wright was there? Because I know you came through Northwest High School. <laughs> Yes, yes, I did. Um, so after I graduated from college, University of Maryland, I always said that I wanted to work with my coaches. I wanted to get back for at least a year. Yeah. Um, and Kevin Monroe had claimed to be retired um, that year. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, it's either Monroe or Blood. And when Blood, and Blood, was, um, Blood was still coaching. So I called Blood up and I was like, hey, do you want an assistant coach? And he happily had me. Um, so yeah, and I ended up working with, uh, with Taylor and um leandra carrera lenana carrera i mean just like some jump dynasties over there um and they were amazing athletes to this day so amazing and um yeah monsters they were awesome kids i've had everyone i had the the whole korea uh family every one of them uh, that was a recommendation for them well great awesome. family yeah, I still I try and follow everybody as much as possible. Taylor, mm -hmm. I know Taylor had sort of, sort of an injury bug there for a while. Yeah, but uh, she she yeah. seems to have gotten it together. Um, mm -hmm. I keep pulling for her to to make that next jump in her in her career because I think she has Same a world of potential. You know? Oh yeah, oh yeah, that kid is something special, and I think it's also an amazing testimony to Young Blood, who's just. You oh, know, absolutely. The coach that, keeps, that keeps creating phenoms, and it's awesome. Yeah, great, you know, great stuff going on in Northwest. You know what's funny to me? I'll listen to them. They'll be in my class and be like, blood is so hard on us. Blood is, and I'm like, yeah, but look where you are today. Like, I'm thinking in my yeah. mind, you know, look where you yeah. are because he's like this with you, yeah. you know, and, and they don't understand it, but when they'll look back on it, Years from now, they'll be like, yeah, I guess yeah. I see what, you know, because I'm sure there were people like that when I when I was playing that, that I used oh, to think oh, that yeah. way. Not, not everyone, it's not, not everyone expects greatness from you. And that, right. and young blood right. expects greatness from you. Exactly. Um, yeah. And that's what it is, yeah. I mean, there's a reason that guy wins a lot of state titles as a coach. <laughs> you know, there's, <laughs> there's a reason. 100% true. There is a he, reason. Yeah. He optimizes the most out of any athlete and he sees something in you if he pushes you like that i i was actually yeah. coaching his throwers before nice. covid hit and then it just went uh, in the can from there but yeah. uh you never know when he'll recruit me to come back out because i was a <laughs> i was a shot and disc guy myself growing up so very nice sort of know a little bit about that but yeah. all right so share with us your training regimen how, how are you keeping yourself in shape how, what do you do to take care of yourself because you're young and I know you still have further aspirations, right? Yeah. I mean, aspiration wise, I definitely still want to do um, another Olympics. Um, by then I'll be 29, 30 around, um, which is, which is really actually prime jumping age. Uh, your late twenties to your early thirties seems to be like the sweet spot for a lot of athletes. Right. Um, but my, my daily regimen uh, before COVID was quite crazy. I, I did take off second semester to train for the Olympics this year. So it was my first time not working and training. Um, but normally I wake up around like 6, 6.30. I hit the weight room. Um, it tends to be around 6. Um, and I lift for about an hour. I normally lift at Kennedy and then go to the classroom. But during the pandemic, I actually built my own lifting situation in my basement. Oh, nice. Um, so I can now get up and go downstairs and lift and then get dressed and go to work after work. Um, I used to have to drive directly to the track, so I'd be on the track. I'd end work about 2.45, and I'd be on the track by 3.15. Um, 
and I'd work out from there and I'd be at least two to three hours on there. Um, I'd probably watch film or top of discuss drum stuff with my, with my coach and then I'd go home and do it all over again. Um, now my practices are a little are further in the evening. So same thing in the morning, except now I have a couple hours of break um, yeah. in the evening before I go on the track, which is nice. I can take a nap. Yeah, uh, I understand um, that. But the same thing happens all over again. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, and if I'm not on the track, I'm recovering, uh, whether it's just a light bike ride, whether it's being a physiotherapist, a massage therapist, I take recovery very, very seriously. I only have one body in this lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Triple jump is not, is not kind to your body if you make any slightest mistake. Um, and so I definitely take the ability to recover as like my number one priority. Yeah. Do you take okay. any <laughs> given point in time and train with other uh, athletes that you that you compete against or compete with so I'm actually I've never been able to do like I said training camp or such because of work mm -hmm. um, but I'm planning on doing one after like towards winter break uh, which I'm excited about it'll probably be in Guadalupe um, which oh. is next to Dominica oh. yeah. um, but there is that um, but most of the time actually I have training partners so I normally train with them um, and I see them on a regular basis. This is the longest actually I've gone without seeing them. And it's because I was traveling and then my season ended and now I'm on my month of break. So I'm not going to practice. So this is the longest I've gone without seeing. How's it um, feel to have some downtime for yourself though right now? It's, it's awesome. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm eating pizza and it's lovely. <laughs> is that that guilty pleasure question I was going to ask you about? It is. It's that and pastries. I have a sweet tooth. Oh. And I love, I love pastries, um, especially like citrus ones, like lemon tarts and yeah. <laughs> so when, <laughs> so you're not, been, uh, <laughs> when you're not treating yourself like that, though, what's your, what's your daily, like to keep yourself nourished and uh, uh, optimizing your, your full body, yeah. what, what do you have? Like, how's your day on wine with food? So um, my meals tend to be at least somewhat planned out at least the day before. Um, it's just easier to eat right when you have the proper options, you know, right. ready in hand. Yeah. Um, so I'll so I'll li I always lift first. My body is not like everyone else's. I lift better if I don't have food in my system. So I lift, but immediately after I eat. <laughs> um, and I normally do a fruit salad and um, some form of protein, whether it's be turkey bacon in the morning. Yeah. And then my my rule for myself is that I don't do bread or grains. So I do complex carbs like uh, vegetables and such um, and protein, but that is it. That's it. Uh, and so I actually went around, I think like nine months without rice or oh, pasta. Wow. Um, so like to be able to eat like pizza, how I want to eat pizza is a big deal because I wasn't eating bread <laughs> for quite a though. while. That's yeah, tough. but I mean, it, it, it yielded the results I, I want. And I think that's one thing you realize when you get to like an elite level is that, you know, I'm really competitive. And if it means cutting out one kind of food group to make me a winner, I'm going to do it. Right. <laughs> I'm going to do it. No problem. Asked. Um, so it is difficult because you crave it. But then, yeah, of course, you do well I mean, and you forget about it. We're two months out, or two years. <clears throat> I'm sorry. We're about two years out of the next Summer Olympics, right? No, wait. Yeah. Three. Yes, three. three years. Yeah, three almost, years. Almost two. Yeah, almost so two. So yeah. when will you kind of flip the switch and ratchet everything up a little bit? So um, the interesting thing is that because of COVID, we've had this kind of compression of years. So normally there's a little bit of a downtime, maybe a year and a half. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the, the situation at hand is that um, COVID pushed everything to 2022. Yeah. So yeah. the Olympics was this year. Yeah. However, Indoor World is next year, is in, is in um, March. Okay. Outdoor World in Eugene is at the end of the year. I have Commonwealth Games before the, after that in Birmingham. And I have a, um, a regional championship, NACAC, in Bahamas. So it's kind of funny because, like, you know, I think you think about, like, ramping it up for the Olympic year. But I kind of have to, like, keep that momentum going because yeah. it's back-to-back -back yeah. elite season. Um, so maybe after 2022, I'll take, maybe um, things might die down. But the way I see it is that every season is an opportunity to get better. Yeah, um, sure. And of course, yeah. Olympic season is always going to bring out the best in people. And you always plan for your Olympic year, at least a year, a year, a year and a half ahead. Um, so, you know, after 2022, maybe I might do some less meets. Um, 
and then kind of you know prepare my body for you know olympic season yeah uh but at this point you know we're we're going olympics straight into two worlds in one year it's top of your game that's what we yeah. are right now you don't get much downtime you better enjoy that pizza and those pastries now kid hey thank you <laughs> who are some of your biggest rivals who who mm. who really pushes you from that perspective Hmm. So I think right now my biggest rival is going to be Yulmar Rojas. She's like number one in the world. Um, I was really upset uh, at the Olympics when, you know, I fouled some big, really big jumps because I actually saw her kind of checking me out. Like, wait a minute, like this girl could do something. <laughs> um, and I wanted to be that competitor for her, you know, kind of push her um, and have her kind of push me too. You push each other to great time. So sure. there's that. And so that's the gold medalist. And also one of my good friends, Patricia Momona, who is who got the silver medal, um, is also a great competitor. It's great to have a French bump the track, but to totally bump heads on the track. It's awesome. Right. Um, and I will say my last biggest competitor is myself. I think that so much of track and field is mental. And a lot of time it's getting over yourself and trusting yourself. And there are definitely situations where I look back and I'm like, you know, if I had just gotten over myself or just trusted my gut, I would have been fine. Yeah. Been fine. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's like a big one that I don't think a lot of athletes uh, think about. Like you're you're competing about everyone else, but you're also competing to be the best version of yourself. That's a big one. Do you sit and talk with them? Do you do you exchange like approaches? Do you exchange, you know, how they do things to to maximize themselves in terms of their performance? So you know not so much because there is a language barrier. I know Spanglish. I am not fluent in Spanish. Um, okay. But Patricia, Patricia, I actually have been, this, this last year I've spoken to her quite a bit. Our coaches are, are close, are good friends now. Um, and it's great to kind of hear her feedback and like her point of view. Um, and we have like good conversations. So she's the one I speak to the most. I okay. would say that okay. and Shanika Ricketts from Jamaica. We have some good report too. Um, and it's, it's very nice because sometimes people don't know that the track and field world can be kind of hush-hush, like no one wants to share their secrets. Right. Um, right. But the truth is, is that if you tell a little bit of information, just a little bit, you know, it pushes everyone ahead. You know, you end up getting a really great competition at the end of it. And it's for the betterment of the sport. It's awesome. Can I ask you a question sure. way up obscure? So we're talking sure. about talking with different athletes. Did you know Shikari Richardson and what did you – what did you think of the situation with her? Because she's a mm. fantastic runner. I mean, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. Um, I think it's Shakari's uh, situation is kind of like, it's really interesting to me um, because from the purely the, the entertainment aspect, it is entertaining, right? Um, right? We love to see smack talking occurring. We love to see the banter on social media. And also, you know, even with her success and her downfall, there has been a moment where she was like a hero and now she's almost seen as like a villain but I, I like that I think it keeps things interesting I think every sport needs a bit of a villain track is not always in the headlines and it's keeping track in the headlines right now from that but from the athlete's point of view I think that if you're gonna talk you gotta be able to back it up yeah um but I also think that Shakari has so much she's young you know she's young she's learning she just got this spotlight thrusted upon her yeah. and she's learning how to yeah. navigate that world and so do I did I expect her to do it flawlessly no did I expect her to, to do it with a little maybe a little bit more grace yeah um but she's also learning and you gotta like allow for that learning curve it's a harsh way to learn but she is learning she'll, she'll be a different kid when it comes to the next Olympic Games and we know Absolutely. we know she'll be there competing no doubt mm -hmm. and I I I you know as as a teacher uh, a veteran teacher uh, a veteran coach that you would, you know, like I know Monroe and, and Youngblood, same thing. You look at people like that and you say they're young and they're making mm -hmm. those decisions that yeah. they'll look back at and say, hmm, I don't know what I was thinking, but let me just move yeah. on. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So, all right. So let's talk about some positives and some negatives okay. in terms of influences in your life. Mm -hmm. And I know we've already okay. covered them off off camera uh, because yeah. we have them in common, but talk a yeah. little bit about them. Throw some, throw some praise out there, if you will. <laughs> um, I'm going to say, I, I think I, I can't even begin this story without even like acknowledging my coaches, the coaches of my life, truly Kevin Monroe, um, who helped me fall in love with this sport, Robert Youngblood, who showed me how to get to another level in this sport. Um, Andrew Valman for getting me in the University of Maryland, Frank Costello, 
Um, no one, and a lot of people know this, but I actually am not an All-American in triple jumps in college. I'm an All-American multiple times in high jump. And Frank Costello was my coach. And that man taught me discipline like no other. Um, and he also told me that I should go pro and triple jump. <laughs> he was like, you know, you're a great high jumper, but you have so much more growth um, available in triple jump. And um, last but not least is my current coach, um, Aaron Gasson, who has just, you know, molded me in, in, in these four years into one of the best jumpers in the world. I am top yeah. 10 in the world. Yeah. That is wild. <laughs> wild, wild, wild. I'm an Olympic finalist. I'm top 10 in the world. I am a signed athlete. Um, shout out to Adidas. And um, I just could not have even fathomed, you know, this. I'm just this little girl from a little country yeah. who immigrated to America for a better life with their parents. And here I am representing the, and being the face of my country because of these people that I met um, and helped me along the way. And I just, words can't even, can't even begin to express how thankful I am to have them in my life. I truly am. And they're all still in my life and they all still look out for me. And so I'm grateful. So that is like my, my positive influences. Um, hmm, negative influences. You don't have to be specific when it comes to that, because there's always that one person <laughs> and you'll probably agree with me because I know I've always been motivated by, I probably been more motivated by people telling me that I can't do what I'm going to do than people that have already said, you can do this. But uh, there's always okay. that one or two people who are like, eh, you know, okay. I don't have any right, faith fine. in you. Listen, okay, so um, I I am a, I'm a double-armed triple jumper. I'm not sure if you know what that means. So no. I jump like a guy. So most women jump one arm in front of the other, like almost like a dramatic arm swing. And you're out here. Um, guys jump double arm like okay. this almost um and that is not common it is not common to see a female jumper double arm um it is very very rare um and i remember when i told i was working with another with a different coach straight out of uh, college i won't name names but this coach when i told him i was like you know i think i can double arm it makes sense these guys look so powerful i want to do it and i like tried it but i looked of course, crazy because my first time trying it out, sure. and he laughed at me and he told me to stick to single arm. <laughs> and so, and here I am, <laughs> four years later, Olympic finalist, double arming. Yeah. Um, and when I met Aaron and I told him day one that I wanted to double arm, yeah. and the next day yeah. we had our first practice. And while we were doing drills, you know, I'm just going back to regular, to you know, known behavior. I was doing single arm drills, and he stops me. He's like, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, oh, I'm doing the drills. He's like, you told me you wanted a double arm. If we're going to do this, you commit to it today. And I was like, day one. And he was like, yeah. 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 He's like, it's either you commit here or you don't do it. And and that just the, the complete shift in mindset was insane to me. I had someone laughing at me. Yeah. And then I yeah. had someone that instead of laughing at me, knowing I was going to look dumb trying it the first time anyway, was like, if you're going to do this, be about it. And um, yeah, so yeah. that was really good night. Yeah. Motivation. <laughs> it is. It, it really is. I, I mean, I get it. I've had it from the teaching standpoint. Somebody just told mm -hmm. me that, you know, you're not a very good teacher, which made me take my game to a whole different level. Yeah, and, and just, cool. oh, I would love to go right in her face right now and just show her the kind of teacher I am and how well I'm uh, respected and received. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I had it as a coach, you know, yeah. and uh, as an athlete when I was younger, I had to prove people so it, it you'll see it you're a young pup you'll see it all through life people will challenge you with those types of comments yeah. Frank Costello it's so funny you mentioned him I had a guest on I have not released his podcast yet because he was working with like the UFC basketball team uh UCF I'm sorry Central Florida mm -hmm. basketball team and moved on to another job anyway long story short he had high praise he uh, worked with Frank Costello at the University of Maryland, and and he really uh -huh. was motivated by him. He's he sounds like a person I need to reach out to and speak to because he sounds Frank, like he brings a lot to the table. To... I mean, he was the head coach in the '80s when Maryland was winning conferences just off field events. Right. He his joke was that he would tell the track the track athletes after the field athletes were done, he would tell them, "You can compete if you want to, but we already won." Right. Okay. <laughs> There you go. That's wild. And he was, and he, and he coached everything, and he's literally amazing on the track and off the track. Truly a gem.
Yeah. That's that's one of those people you need in your life too, you know. Yeah. So let's talk about game uh, meat day. I don't want to call it game day. Mm. Let's talk about meat day. Any rituals or routines in your life? Because all athletes um, have a little something. <laughs> so I make sure I have my last meal um, about two and a half to three hours before I compete. I hate feeling food in my stomach. Yeah. Um, yeah. And honestly, I try to just kind of stay off my feet a little bit. Um, but I try not to get too much into a ritual, actually, because the truth of the matter is things change. You know, track and field is an international sport. Right. Um, and there was a time, I mean, my first Diamond League meet this year was in Doha. And we did the meet, I think, in like three days. In three days, I was there competing and out. So there was no like time adjustment. I was super tired. The day before I competed, I felt like trash. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the day came and I was fine. And it's just, you know, make sure you're, you're ready to go. If you're, if you're tired, I had to change my sleep patterns, make sure I got a little nap. I normally don't take naps that much. Um, I just make sure I get a lot of sleep the night before. And, but I think what really keeps me, you know, just kind of regular is yeah. making sure I have a meal two, three hours before and um, just a little cup of coffee. And it's just like, it's a little moment just, once that's done, I feel like, you know, a switch is turned on. I got my meal. I got some rest. I got a little coffee. That's the only time I drink coffee is when I compete. Wow. Um, yeah. Nothing in the morning I, I run, to get I, you going. No. Because the only drink I, the only thing I drink in season, honestly, majority of the time is water. Oh. <laughs> I, I always drink water. That's the one thing diet-wise that never changes in season or out of season. Maybe that's a lie. Out of season, I will have one or two milkshakes. But in season, it is 100% water. That's all I drink. So you, you're going to sneak a milkshake or two in right now with that pizza and the pastries? I already did. I had oh, a milkshake okay. like week one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely do one more before, you know, the season, my off season's over. You have to. You absolutely have to. You've got to treat yourself because you're treating all of us to your your world-renowned abilities and and that's a special thing i know i Thank i love you. track and field i really love track and field it's awesome I'm, I'm a football guy i'm a hockey guy i'm a baseball guy but i yeah. love watching track athletes you're I, I think you're special athletes just you're just your talent is just so unique and special compared to somebody who hits a baseball or you know throws a football and that's just obviously that's my opinion but I've mm -hmm. always just like when track and field's on it, it, any time, it doesn't have to be the Olympics. It could be on, you know, NBC sports, whatever. I stop and watch it. And, and I, and I always tell my wife the same thing. I love watching these people run and jump and they barely throw the, th they barely show the throwers, which I feel is a little disappointing because uh, uh, those yeah. people work hard. Those people they work, work really so hard. hard. You're talking about guys that are stronger than most NFL players. So Absolutely. Gonna... Absolutely. Yeah. And they probably have a better head on their shoulders than a lot of those guys too. Yeah, I've, I've I haven't met a lot of like dumb throwers. I'm a lot of well educated, right? You know, finance right. engineers. Yeah, even pre med, business, very wow. smart, very smart people. Yeah. All right, so two Olympics already, a third one on the horizon. You've already shared you're not riding off into any sunset just yet. You're too young. Talk us through the Olympics. Tell us all about it. Because people have no idea. They see you parade into a stadium. They watch you perform. But the yeah. whole big, the whole big complexion of the, the Olympics, it's got to be something that is just so unique and special. You must have butterflies the whole time you do a lot of that stuff. So I will say that the butterflies hit um, when I first got there. And I was I wasn't even in even in the village yet for Tokyo. Mind you, um, so I did compete in 2016 Olympics. I got hurt. I finished like almost dead last. I hurt my hamstring really badly. And that kind of like became a chip on my shoulder. I told myself I was going to be like something great uh, my next Olympics. So fast forward to this present story. Um, so yeah, I got there and there was definitely butterflies. Um, and I got into my training camp, but it was, it was nice because it wasn't very populated because of COVID. Our training camp was almost like empty. Um, and so we got time to like, acclimate to the time time zone it took two weeks to acclimate to that time zone um and we got you know a place to train that wasn't very crowded um and we got to just kind of settle in a little bit and get a little bit of the tokyo culture um before we head to the village 
Um, and then when she got in the village, it just kind of, the first day was just like a little overwhelming mm -hmm. because you get through the entrance, you get your like, accreditation, and then they drive you out of this like tunnel. And then all of a sudden you're in this massive city with flags everywhere on every building, these like tall buildings. And you realize like, oh yeah, you know, the best of the world are all here in a little town made just for us. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's insane. Um, but after a few days, it becomes your norm. You, you get used to seeing certain people in the hallways. You get used to seeing um, certain faces in the dining hall. You start making friends. We do pin exchanges. You get an Olympic pin for every yeah. nation. And it's a great um, topic of conversation. And so I met a lot of people because Dominica is a very small delegation. Right. So everyone wants a pin. <laughs> but everyone wants their pin. Yeah. Um, and so that was like a great, you know, starting conversation. Um, and then about... I will say I, I felt a little flustered and I think Aaron picked up on that and he kind of asked, he was like, are you okay? Like we're here, we're ready to go. And you just seem a little off. And I think just that little conversation helped kind of shake me up a little bit. I'm mm -hmm. like, you're right. Like, whoa, I don't have time to be off. We're here. I was cranking into full gear. I had my PT with me. Her name is Kalal Flag, and she's been like a PT, a therapist, uh, like a, an aunt to me. Love her. Um, I really felt like I had my dream team there. Um, and we, I got so serious. I micromanaged my food. Um, our training was on point. I micromanaged, micromanaged my recovery and my body. Kala helped me with that. And I got so strict with my diet there that from the time I got there to the time I last competed, I had lost around eight pounds. Wow. It was just wow. lean, crazy muscle. It was easily the best shape of my life. Um, and we knew we were onto something great. And I think at that point, there were, there were no nerves um it was just let's go yeah and um but it was it was truly amazing I mean from competing there even in an empty stadium yeah. I mean the feeling was still overwhelming there was still so much pride there um and even at the opening ceremony you know which is and it's still a somewhat empty uh, stadium there was still so much pride there um but little secret what no one tells you about opening and closing ceremonies they are very long what you're seeing is two hours on the screen mm -hmm. for the athlete is seven to eight hours of standing, oh my God. walking around, navigating. Yeah, it's really long. So a lot of athletes actually, if they've gone to an opening ceremony, they might not show up to another one. Like if they've gone to 2012 Olympics and then opening ceremony, they might not do 2016 and 2020 because it's a lot of your life. Like gymnasts won't ever do it because they're one of the first events. So they yeah. can't recover in time. Sure. Um, we were so tired after the opening ceremony that we did nothing the next day. It was just to recover, yeah. like rest. <laughs> um, but that's what that's what it's like. So everyone wears, you know, comfortable shoes. You might you might think, why aren't they in heels? Why are they in sneakers or something? Yeah, because we're on, we're on our feet for seven, seven hours. or eight hours. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine that would be so daunting so I, on me. Yeah, and I may not hot. make the first one if it was me. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, yeah, you, yeah. You always, you always do one for the memories. You got to do one for the memories. Um, but after you choose which one you want to go to. <laughs> yeah, I'll Uber over from my hotel or from my from the Olympic Village if you let me know right before we're ready to go. That's what I probably right have. Before. You met any of the, um, um, the Olympic athletes that we have in Montgomery County? Have hmm. you? Um, I, I'm not sure. I think I may, I think I might have met Katie Ledecky in 2016. Okay. Um. I'm trying to think of who, who else from around here. I, I've met Noah Lyles. He counts from being around here. Um, name some other names for me. Well, we have a girl in Northwest. She is. Uh, she was one of the alternates for the gymnast, Kayla DiCello. Oh, that's so cool. I think I might have met her, but I don't yeah. think I like know her. Yeah. 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 Helen yeah. Maroulis, who won a gold medal for the U.S. She was the first female gold medalist uh, wrestler. Uh, oh my god Olympics. girl power yeah i look i i taught her for two years helen no yeah way. yeah she went to uh awesome. da, 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 da. well she started out at magruder as a ninth grader and then she was shipped off to what like minnesota or wherever wherever the training wow. facility olympic training facility mm -hmm. is and then she wrestled this year i believe she got bronze this year but we, nice. that's kind of neat that we've had so many uh um, yeah so many people keep asking me about that and i'm just like i don't know maybe it's something in the water maybe it's the old bay i don't know but I, I, it could be the old bay <laughs> yeah the crabs in the old bay absolutely I, I know kayla and i are going to try and connect and do a do a live one at at school sometime uh nice. once things kind of say it's been you know it's been insane it's been yeah. insane teaching so far yeah. this year anybody who thinks teachers 
had it easy last year. Well, you know what? We're getting paid back triple what you oh, thought yeah. we got last year. It's it's oh, yeah. and, and like how do you balance that? You're a teacher. <laughs> how do you balance um, that? I have learned to really utilize my planning, uh, my planning schedule. Yeah. Um, so you know, right now I have second and third period is planning, I believe. And when I tell you I plan, I plan. <laughs> yeah. Everything is done. Normally I even the night before, I'll have a to-do list ready yep. to get things done um, because I just don't want things to really overflow um, on the track. And I have yep. become really good at, I have become really good at, you know, just when I'm on the track, worry about the track. That's it. Because I can't let work mentally interfere. Absolutely. Interfere, you know, what I'm on the track. It doesn't make sense. Um, but I will say I'm, I'm tired quite a bit. <laughs> I'm tired quite a bit. Um, and I do love teaching. I'm honestly not quite sure how long I'll stay teaching. Um, just because, you know, track life is picking up and I'm doing well. And um, it might, I think it might be time to, you know, give it my full attention. Um, and, uh, but it, it definitely is quite a bit, especially right now, especially right now. Um, teachers are overworked. Every teacher I know is tired right now. Who sponsors so. you? Adidas. Okay. I think I yeah. heard you give them a little shout out there in <laughs> the middle of what we, in the middle of what we were talking about. That's awesome. I forgot to ask yeah. you this question. How many from Dominica were at the Olympics competed? Uh, two, one, one male, one female. So I was the female. And, so did you get uh, to hold the flag? So yeah, so we were supposed to be a dual, we were dual flag holders. Um, but the thing is my national wear is quite heavy. It's called a Wob Duet. And it is like almost two layers of dress okay. and it's heavy, like linen fabric. Um, so at, at the beginning of the, of when they announced our country, Danik and I both had our hands on the flag and we paraded in together. And about halfway through, I let him hold the flag and I held the dress oh. um, and I like showed it off. <laughs> so he got a little special moment. We became, you know, dual flag holders. I was the flag bearer for the closing ceremony. Um, and I, I love the dress, so I was totally fine with, you know, showing off the dress. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That 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 is like, I always love watching to see who brings that in. And, and I think that is a, a kind of like an amazing privilege, even if there's just two of you. I mean, just being able to represent your country. And I know we have a lot of turmoil. You know, we have a lot of turmoil in the United States. I still think respecting the flag, no matter how you feel, is so very important because it is a representation of, of our culture in a lot of ways, whether you agree with it or not. And mm -hmm. bringing that thing in really shows your, your sincereness. So Yeah, for sure. And I will say that's the one thing I love. Um, Americans are known for repping their flag very, very hard. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's the best thing about the Olympics is everyone's doing it, you know? Yeah. No matter what the turmoil is at the moment, when you yeah. see, you know, yeah. your team yeah. doing well, you can't help but rally behind them. No, I That's agree. Awesome. Do you have dual citizenship? Yes, I do. Two passports. <laughs> oh, congratulations. That's an awesome thing to have, too. I've often yeah. kicked around getting dual citizenship for Italy. My wife looks at me do like, it. yeah, she looks at me like, do why, why do you want to do that? I said, I don't know where I'm going do to it. end up in the end. You never know. I might you drag don't. it to Italy. Who knows? You don't. And, and, you know, who knows? You might need that for verification. You might have like a family member that needs proof of like Italian heritage. Yeah. Yeah. I always say get the second passport. And then when you can travel with it. Travel. Yeah, and it doesn't it seem like it's, it's not really the most daunting thing to do, is it? It's, it just seems like. You just got to go ahead and do what you need to do. All right. So I just, let me just ask you a couple more questions. The, the first one is, is there anything you would have done differently along the way? Mm. Is there anything you would have changed or have you, have you gone a path that has been laid out for you and you embrace it every step of the way? I think I embrace it every step of the way because I, if I did anything differently, I don't know if I would have gotten to where I am today. Um, especially so quickly. Um, I'm one of the few athletes that can say that they, they get better every year in their sport. That is not normal. <laughs> in our sport, it's very difficult. And I have to take, you know, take that into consideration. The only thing I probably would have done differently was Olympic finals in Japan. I would have moved back a little bit. <laughs> That's the only thing in the journey I would have done differently. But every, 
you know, every hard time I went through, every success I went through, every person I met, you know, has brought me to a point where I am, you know, where I am elite. Yeah. One of the best in the world. And I just don't know if I would risk changing things in the past. Um, if it would lead me to the same result. Who are some of your favorite athletes in any sport, any in, year, any, anything? Right. Yeah. Some of your favorites. Um, let's, let's start with track because it's an obvious. Um, I really like um, Sydney McLaughlin. Um, I think oh, that yeah. she is an uh, amazing representation for the future of track and field. Um, uh, not in track, I will go Serena Williams. Um, just amazing and dominating for minority women everywhere, minority girls. I'm um, trying to join, attempting to join the tennis world. She sure. just broke so many glass ceilings for them, for, for the Naomi's and the Coco's behind her. Um, not in tennis, let's go gymnastics. Um, Lori Hernandez and Simone Biles. Um, Lori is actually a friend of our friend, so like <laughs> a yeah. slight bias there. Um, but Simone is just so headstrong and is so confident in who she is. Um, even after some, you know, serious trauma she dealt with um, within USA Gymnastics. Um, but she just shows, you know, how powerful and how important it is to rise above your ad um, adversity. Yeah. Um, and I think, hmm, I just, I, I don't know, maybe I'm a little biased. I just named all female. <laughs> um, but, hmm. It's okay to be like it's okay. I'm good with it. It's okay to be a little biased. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I think, you know, in a general sense, uh, well, in the world of triple jump, I would say Teddy Tamgo and Jonathan Edwards, Christian Taylor, just like Will Clay, even just the, the crazy, like, talented guys that are just pushing the limits of track and field constantly. And for me, you know, it's also inspiration because they – jump the way I jump so that's yeah. the thing about me I have to watch men jump to, to learn I can't watch a lot of women jump to learn my sport um thank for that who was the boy from Virginia that uh, he was 20 I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now I thoroughly enjoyed watching him jump and I was so bummed out he didn't make the finals he's a 22 year old boy I think he was from Virginia I can't remember Virginia I think it was Virginia did he, did he compete for USA yeah for USA Hmm, that's so odd. USA was Will Clay, Chris Bernard, and Donald Scott. He, he, so he was, was the he's the youngest. I think he was the youngest jumper, though. What is he? He was like 22, right? This kid. I, I can't remember. I'll, when I see you, when I see you, I'll know who it is. And I'll be like, yeah, I know who it was. Yeah, hey, I remind just, me. I'm totally back. I, I was just so heartbroken for him. Uh, just the look in his eyes and everything. He, I think he had scratched on his last jump or he just didn't get there. He didn't make the line. And I was like, yeah. man, he, you know, he's level of determination. And he just, that's the one other thing I think I'd love most about uh, track and field. You're out there, you're competing and you're yeah. working so hard for yourself. And although I yeah. love team sports, um, there is nobody that you let down but yourself when you don't get it done. Whereas with a team sport, you're letting, you know, 10 other guys down. If you fail at base at football, you know, that that's a different story. Somebody else can pick you up and nobody even know you failed at your job that day. But when you fail at yeah. your job as a triple jumper, when you fail at your job running a hundred meter, when you fail at your job, throwing a hammer, that's on you, you know? Yeah. I always say there's no greater disappointment than self-disappointment. There's not. <laughs> right. None. All right. So, I've, I've covered just a world of, this has been so much fun for me and I hope for you too, but I do this yeah. final segment. It's called, we just got to know. And I want to know <clears throat> at least three of the moments you are most proud of in your young career. Wow. Um, hmm. Okay. Well, I will say, <sighs> of course, uh, making finals at this Olympic Games in 2021, becoming the first Dominique to make any Olympic finals. Yeah. Um, before, before that, um, I will say, oh, qualifying for the Olympics, um, for 2021 Olympics, because it happened after I had a grade two tear in my quad. Oh, wow. So I wasn't, I wasn't able to compete at Outdoor Worlds in Doha in 2019. 
Um, and actually, I found out I had the injury there. I didn't compete while I was there. Sure. Um, and sure. my and my first meet back on my first jump, I qualified for the Olympics. Um, and that was, you know, awesome. Yeah, that brings a smile um, to my face. <laughs> and uh, hmm. and other than that, it was becoming uh, the first medalist for Team Dominica at the Commonwealth Games. So there's the Olympic Games, and there's the Commonwealth Games, the major game um, for Commonwealth Nations. And it was awesome to make history there and to hold that flag high above your head and see your victory last. That was what, 2018? Yes, 2018. So the next one is next year in Birmingham. I'm sure you'll do outstanding there. Hey, thank, thank you for you. giving us some of your time. Uh, it's been thank awesome. You. No problem. It's been awesome finally getting to meet you and share some commonalities. And just, uh, uh, I want to congratulate you again. Uh, I'm so proud of the person that that you are, that you represent. As a teacher from where I, the county we teach in, you're a great role model for, for so many from that perspective too. So uh, I wish you nothing but continued success. And when you get over to, to Northwest, pop through 181. That's where I'm at. Sure, 181. Yep, that's me. I can't wait. Take care. All right. Thank you for having me. No problem. One more time, the Original Sports Podcast with Mark Maraday would like to thank Olympic athlete Thea LaFawn for being a guest on the show. Uh, great insight on how she takes care of herself, both physically and mentally, to stay at the top of her game. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye out for her going into the 2024 Olympic Games to see if she can put herself up on the medal stand this time. Um, you can find Thea on Twitter at Thea LaFawn. That's at T-H-E-A-L-A-F-O-N-D. Connect with us here on the Original Sports Podcast by checking out our website, our apps, and much more. Uh, our website, OriginalSportsPodcast.com. Uh, like our Facebook page, join our Twitter conversation, um, reach out to us on Snapchat. All that you can find us at OSP with MM. Uh, follow us on Instagram, watch our TikToks, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. All those things you can find at Original Sports Podcast. Hey, feel free to let us know if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, you know, give us a shout out, whatever you need to do by emailing us at original sports podcast at gmail.com. I'd like to thank our audio engineer, Sean Ankoviak, our video engineer, Angela Ankoviak, uh, our voice intro, Matt Noble, our intro and outro music, which is provided by Ryan Benton and Preston Harper, uh, part of the barbershop gang and my social media manager William Franciscus uh, webmaster extraordinaire Terry Meriday hey join us each week to experience the O on the original sports podcast game time from the original sports cast and live about your favorite plays cause it's game time from the original we knew all your teams and we could go on for days it's game time from the original Highlights and playoffs and very special guests It's game time on the original So sit right back, we're gonna tell you a story Of heroes and warriors who played for the glory They're about to see it in your stadium chair We know all your teams and we can go on for days It's game time from the original Highlights and playoffs and very special guests It's game time on the original Sportscast show by the Pets and Pets